This is London, the capital of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. At one time, much of the world was ruled from here. The British Empire stretched from colonies in America, sultanates in India, isles in the Caribbean, and desert kingdoms in Africa. For such a small place, it's only a bit larger than Greece, and even today has less than 65 million people, its influence on the world has been extraordinary. Shakespeare, the Industrial Revolution, the English language, even the Beatles, all hail from the United Kingdom. The UK has also had, and still has, a remarkable impact on the democratic world. We see the origins of human rights law in the Magna Carta signed in the year 1215. And the UK's legislature is called the mother of all parliaments because of its role as a model for new democracies over the past 200 years. In world politics, the UK is a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, a leading member of the European Union, and the United States' closest ally. There's no question that knowing this England, as Shakespeare called it, is to go a long way towards understanding democracy itself. I'm Bob Beatty, and in this program we will explore the British political system to better know and understand the keys and nuances of a parliament that in some form or other has influenced every single democracy in the world. on political parties in the United Kingdom. What are the main policy positions of the Labour, Conservative, and Liberal Democratic parties here? And what are the key differences and similarities between the three? We'll try to answer those questions by talking to members of Parliament from these parties. In this program, the British political parties. If uh, somebody didn't know a lot about the Conservative Party, uh, how would you characterize the Conservative Party in Great Britain? The Conservative Party is basically a party that believes in the freedom of the individual, allowing them choice and opportunity to make their own decisions on behalf of themselves and their family. And what do you believe are the two or three main issues uh, for the Conservative Party right now? Winning the next election is the main <laughs> issue, there is no other. And what issues uh, is the Conservative Party, in your opinion, strikingly different from the uh, opposition? We believe in uh, lower taxation so that people can actually use their own money, make their own decisions about how they spend that money. We believe in good public services, but they need to be properly managed and properly delivered. And the power to make those decisions are better down at a lower level than at the central government in Whitehall. The Conservative Party was the party of Great Britain throughout the 1980s under Margaret Thatcher and then under Prime Minister John Major. However, since 1997, 
and onwards, the conservatives have been in the doldrums. Where do they stand now and how are they going to get out of this political abyss? We talk to members of the conservative party to find out where they see their party going in the future. The, well, the main characteristics are our beliefs and our experience. Um, our beliefs are centered around the uh, belief in the individual and in the freedom of the individual to do his best on his own account, um, coupled with a duty on the part of individuals to look after those who who aren't able to look after themselves. So it's a um, it's freedom linked with compassion, um, and that is the basis of our belief system. We believe in a strong, uh, independent British uh, nation as well, and uh, that leads us into our experience. During the last century, we were the party of government for the large majority of the century, and so we have experience of government and many experienced people in our ranks which are which are very valuable for uh, the um, for the formulation of policy and that's why we say same old people same old policies same old tories well let me let me make it absolutely clear I'm very happy to debate the past with the Prime Minister any day he likes, any day he likes. I've, I've got a great big dossier on his past. I've got a great big dossier on his past and I haven't even had to sex it up. It is true that the Conservative Party, also known as the Tories, was the party of government for most of the 20th century. It's also the party that features leaders who have become household names, such as Winston Churchill and Margaret Thatcher. But after their 1997 loss, the party has struggled to find dynamic leadership and has also struggled to not become, as its critics contend, the party of the past in British politics. We really are a, an open party, and I hope we're ones that are a reforming party and ones that will look at challenging ideas and come up with radical solutions. Uh, we see our opponents in the Conservative Party as people who were stuck in history, who found it difficult to make changes, and are uh, behind the times and reluctant to, uh, to make the changes that, uh, that, that are essential if we're going to have a reforming new democracy. Well, the Conservatives are in a, in a really very difficult position indeed. Um, many would feel the, the real skill that um, the Blairite um, style of leadership in the Labour Party has simply been to move the Labour Party very much back into the centre of uh, British politics or closer to the centre of British politics and essentially have taken many conservative policies, adapt to be fair, they've adapted them to what they feel are the um, directions that we should be moving in, but to put it very simply, they've stolen the conservatives' clothes. Also, the conservatives have some very significant structural problems as well as suffering two heavy defeats in the elections that I just mentioned of 1997 and 2001. Increasingly the Conservative Party is becoming a very old party and when I mean old it is the average age of a Conservative Party member, not necessarily their MPs but of those who belong to the Conservative Party is now 65. The Young Conservatives have now dis an organisation for representing um, you know, much younger members it was disbanded a few years ago. It had so few members. So the image that the Conservative Party now has, if, if perhaps not one of irrelevance, it certainly is one of lacking direction. The Conservative Party is made up of people who, were, who could be rebranded as English nationalists. They're, they're little Englanders. I mean, the. Uh, they're very excited about the role of uh, the Lord Chancellor, which is a kind of comic opera, Gilbert and Sullivan, the creature that should have been abolished at least a thousand years ago. Um, but they're tied to tradition, to monarchy, to the past, to dead, stale ideas. And that's part of uh, the, the, the history of the party, the character of the Conservative Party. And they're incapable of seeing any change, uh, or contemplating any change, without opposing it. 
there'll be a, in Parliament today a proposal for regional assemblies, which are very sensible, very much the kind of regional setup uh, that occurs in the United States and throughout most of Europe. <coughs> we have a highly sensitive, uh, we have a high, in Britain we have a highly centralized state, and the idea of uh, having any kind of devolved power to the regions and the nations of the United Kingdom is anathema to them. But they are a party, I believe, uh, very much uh, yesterday, tight tradition, and uh, not one in which we're going to find any vibrant, new, thrusting, challenging ideas. We believe in a, a strong British nation, but that is, we think, wholly compatible with playing a leading role in the European Union. What worries us sometimes is when the European Union appears to go off the rails itself and appears itself not to share our, value, our values of freedom and uh, competition and a strong and thriving economy. Um, so, when we see the European Union going uh, for a single currency, which looks as though it could be economically damaging to the uh, uh, interests of the European Union, we feel extremely apprehensive and we would rather have no part in it. Um, that's why we've taken the view that joining the single currency, which would imply having a single interest rate across the whole of the European zone, um, an interest rate which might be appropriate for, for some parts of that economy, but certainly it wouldn't be appropriate for other parts, that would be very damaging. How does it manifest itself in taxation matters? We believe in keeping taxation as low as possible. One of the reasons we fell out of power in 1997, I think, is that the country believed that we had failed to stick to that belief and that we'd increased taxes in a way in which we shouldn't have done. Um, and I think we had allowed public spending to get a bit out of control and we had taxed people too highly. We've got to make sure that we keep taxation low. That's one of our core beliefs. Who does the Prime Minister believe would make a better Mayor of London, Ken Livingstone or Nicky Gavran? I, of course, always support the Labour candidate. After the 1997 election, the Conservatives found themselves in a position they were not used to, being in the opposition. In British politics, voters watch the opposition carefully, so the Tories' performance in opposition will certainly determine how soon they can regain the party strength in Great Britain they enjoyed in the 20th century. Well, what's happened since we lost the general election in 1997 is that we've had the refreshing opportunity to address the issues that we're going to see in the future. Uh, when you're in government, you don't actually have time to do a lot of forward thinking. And so there is a benefit to opposition, although I much prefer being in government. Uh, the benefit to opposition is that you can actually create the time and the research to look at the solutions to the future generation's problems and how we can deliver conservative answers to those. It's always a difficult, a difficult problem for any opposition. If you produce some decent policies long enough in advance for the, for the public to begin to take them in and to appreciate that they're worth voting for, any government worth its salt will pinch them. Um, and if you fail to do that, then the government will point at you and say, well, at least with this government you've got, you've got some policies. Um, so we are gradually beginning to put together a series of uh, policies now based around the uh, idea of giving people a fair deal. Um, because people, I think, in this country are beginning to feel that they've not had a fair deal. They haven't had a fair deal in relation to the health service because they haven't seen that improve, yet they have seen their taxes go up, they've seen borrowing go up uh, in order to pay for these things that aren't getting any better, and that, uh, so that there is no delivery, uh, as, we keep, uh, as we keep saying. So we're concentrating on bringing our policies together around the idea of giving people a fair deal. 
British party system is often dubbed the two and a half party system. Where does that half come from? It's the Liberal Democratic Party, the combination of the old British Liberal Party and the Social Democrat Democratic Party. Where do they fit in now? Well, they've been gaining slowly but surely support in the last couple of elections. They need to differentiate themselves from the Conservatives and Labour. We talked to a few members of the Liberal Democratic Party to see where they see their party going in the 21st century. I joined the party around 1990, which is before a general election that we had in 1992. Um, and I joined really because at that time we had a, a government headed up by Margaret Thatcher, who will be known to many. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, as Prime Minister, lost her job, and then the, the, another Conservative Prime Minister took over. But really, we had a government that had, had run into the sands. Uh, unlike the American system, people can stay on in the British system as long as they get elected. And the Conservative government had been in power then for 11 years and went on to be in power for 18 years. So I decided to join a political party really as a reaction against that feeling it was time for them to go and I read the Liberal Democrat Manifesto and that was the party I most agreed with. I had no uh, family relationship with any party, I had not been a member of any party of neither of my parents. So I picked up the manifestos, read through them and thought this is the one I agree with uh, and they were opposing the Conservatives in my home district so it all fitted together. And if somebody didn't know very much about the Liberal Democratic Party, how would you introduce them to it and characterize the party yeah. to them? I mean, always, I, I, I speak sometimes to American students when they come over here to study and, and we always have to try and explain what the Liberal Democrat Party is about and I started uh, by saying it's not like any of the American parties but in, in, in balance actually I think it is quite similar to what one would call with a small L a Liberal Democrat in the United States. So it's it's uh, left of centre um, and liberal in the sense that it holds all the socially liberal values. So issues like human rights, uh, like gay rights, like women's rights and so on. Uh, the Liberal Democrats are actually quite firmly on that agenda as well as being uh, in terms of the market and so on, uh, being in favour of free market policies. So on an economic side they're, they're in favour of free market policies but they're socially very liberal as well. Um, and that's really the combination that makes up the Liberal Democrats. I, I, in the UK it's quite different from the Conservatives who tend to be socially conservative uh, but also believe in the free market and Labour who tended to be socially liberal um, but didn't believe in the free market. The, the Labour tradition is believe, one of believing in sort of state central control. That's moved on now uh, but historically the great divide if you like on the amongst the social liberals was between those who joined the Liberal Democrats who believed in the free market and those in the Labour Party who believed in a very centralised state system. Yes, that the party has not only been in existence for 11, 12 years. Uh, previous to that there was the Liberal Party and the Social Democrat Party and they came together and that made the new party, the Liberal Democrat Party. We are the third party but uh, the third major party now, there used to be two major parties and then all sorts of other little bits and pieces. But uh, since the last election, 1997, with 46 MPs and then another one since then, we've actually been a much stronger force in Parliament. And now there are clearly three parties in Britain. In uh, sort of left-right terms, though this doesn't work very conveniently, uh, the Conservatives are always going to be on the right, the Labour Party is sort of on the left, though some of them would doubt that now. And we tend to be the radicals that don't fit so neatly into that definition, because on some issues we would be thought to be uh, libertarian, uh, as our liberal tradition would say. But on social issues, in, to a large extent, we're probably in favour of more direct intervention by the state. For example, we're in favour of higher ta income tax on the very well-off in order to pay for better services for the less well-off. Now the Labour Party's rather gone away from that. Mm -hmm. So we don't tidily fit in. We're not just there in the centre between the other two parties. We have a more radical approach to the issues of the day. I think the Liberal Democrats are increasingly in a strong, in, in a strong position. Although they got 18% uh, of the vote at the last general election, they've only got 50 MPs out of 659. They seem a much more cohesive unit, certainly, than they used to be. And the leader of the, Conserv of the Liberal Democrats, in fact, claims that they are the really viable alternative to Labour, that they are the real opposition. 
Um, they tend, in fact, now on many issues to be quite radically uh, far from Labour. They wish to see electoral reform, they wish to see more constitutional reform, they would like to see a reform of the tax system in order to redirect um, taxes into specific targets, education being one of them. Uh, and certainly uh, that, I think, would you know, help um, the Liberal Democrats considerably. I still think they lack some sense of identity in that they often, I think, are portrayed as somewhere in the middle between the Conservatives um, and Labour. But quite frankly, if you look at the responses of Liberal Democrat supporters to often a range of radical issues, uh, Liberal Democrats are often, if you can use the term very loosely, further to the left often than, than in fact the Labour Party is. Um, and certainly they, they are taking a stronger st uh, stance because they, after 79, they did get clo quite close to the Labour Party. And rumours were circulating that had the 79 election um, I'm sorry, I should be saying the 97 election, the 1997 election. Had, they, um, that, had that been much closer, the Liberal Democrats would have been prepared to go into some kind of coalition, even an informal one, with Labour. But of course that never arose as Labour won by such a, you know, such a large margin. But I still think you know, that they do lack a sense of direction. They are certainly very strongly pro-European, which of course uh, sets them well apart from the Conservatives, who are split very much over that issue. And they certainly also do wish to see more constitutional reform, they wish to see more devolution of power, not just to Scotland and Wales, but also to the English region, something which again the Conservatives are very much opposed to. Labour uh, are not so opposed to that idea, but I think it will be certainly quite a few years yet before we move uh, in, into that position. I mean, Labour has changed, so in some senses it is quite similar to, to the Liberal Democrats and people sort of said, what's the point in having the two parties at a certain point? You are similar. Uh, where I think we, we do still diverge quite strongly is in the debate between central and local government, where the UK has a very centralised system anyway in terms of, of the central government controlling lots of expenditure, not allowing local government to decide how much tax it wants to raise and how much it wants to spend and so on. The Liberal Democrats uh, very firmly believe in, in much more local control and stronger local government. Uh, and the Labour government that's been in power since 1997 has continued to centralise. It's really taken powers to itself uh, in a lot of areas uh, and we want to push the, the powers further out. So our points of dispute are, are really around central local issues. Even where we've made a change, like the introduction of the Scottish Parliament, uh, that's a sort of decentralising issue where the government have said that Scotland can have a parliament rather like a state government that they can get on with things but the Labour central government didn't give them or, or doesn't want them to uh, raise their own taxes and change their own expenditure. We have, again have argued for example that they should have even more power in Scotland so that they can change their tax rates and, and raise more money locally. The Liberal Democrats have a strategy of building their party up from the bottom. They concentrate on becoming more and more popular at the grassroots level in the small towns and villages throughout Great Britain with the idea that this will allow them to compete and win more seats in Parliament. The principal themes that we've been putting forward are um, firstly that we want to invest more in our public services, so that's health and education, which are largely supplied centrally and funded centrally, so we raise a large proportion of income tax at a national level in order to fund our education and health services. And we said in the last two elections that we were prepared to raise income tax higher in order to fund better health and education. Uh, the Labour Party argued that they could deliver better health and education without raising taxes, uh, got elected, and what they actually did was raise taxes after being elected. Um, but we, we were very upfront in the election, and our main appeal was to people who wanted better health and education services and appreciated what they saw as our honesty. Uh, so we were saying, uh, read my lips, we will have new taxes. We were very upfront and said, uh, we will bring in new taxes for health and education. That was our number one selling point. And probably the second selling point is, is building on this local reputation. So we're much, much stronger in local government than we are in central government. Um, we've built up at the local area level so that we have lots of councillors and lots of people on local political bodies. Uh, and we've built on that and where we've got strong local representation we then say okay will you now trust us uh, at the national level and we've been gradually building up election by election by winning local council seats 
and then going forward into the general election and carrying some of that support with us. I'd say in the broad terms we're internationalist, so we have always been pro-Europe, pro the UN. We see the UK's future as actually being fully engaged in these international bodies. Um, and have tended to contrast ourselves at the other end of the spectrum with the Conservatives who tend to be very nationalist as opposed to internationalist and Labour actually who have got people who go in both directions. Labour's very split. Uh, they've got some people who are really quite vehemently anti-Europe and some people who are quite strongly pro-Europe. Um, the Lib Dems, we've got some people anti-Europe but generally speaking we've been at the forefront of trying to push uh, the European Union forward. We see that as our strategic future. I mean, one of the most fascinating things is that the very people who have been st most strongly in favour of the Atlantic Alliance, the special relationship, like Winston Churchill, also recognised that we had to play a leading role in Europe. And uh, you don't have to sign up to the euro to avoid the dollar or sign up to the dollar to avoid the euro. But clearly, in the international world of today, you do need to have partnerships and trading relationships in order to survive. And we're not a very big country anymore, either in trading terms, economic terms, or just in physical terms. What you're looking for all the time, I think, are, 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 it's reasons to justify your existence as politicians. That If the government was perfect, there'd be no point in having any other opposition politicians at all. So there will always be things to criticize. But what we've also tried to do is to change the style of politics. Um, and that's one of our kind of slogans, but it's, it's actually, it resonates with people that historically the British system was that if the government said black, the opposition said white, the government say up, the opposition say down. And, and we don't agree with that. We, we think you should be able to say, look, uh, we like this bill that the government are bringing in, for example, to, to create some new powers for local government. Uh, we like it, but we'd like it to go further. And here are our specific criticisms about where it doesn't go far enough. Uh, mm -hmm. And we think we can go out and oppose on that basis rather than just saying, we don't like the bill, we're going to vote against it. It's, are you, it's more sophisticated. Are you also trying to put, maybe change the culture of this, uh, you know, the games that are played simply yeah. to attack and score Sorry. points rather than actually accomplish anything? Is yeah, I mean, I've, certainly on a personal basis, I, I hate the point scoring type of politics, but also as a party, we tend to lose out in that, in that, for, for example, on the media in the UK, uh, when they're looking for a story, the government have, have said do X, and uh, the media ring, uh, ring around and say, are you going to stand up as the opposition spokesperson and say, that's outrageous, we shouldn't be doing that, we should be doing Y. And uh, they won't take necessarily a spokesperson who's saying, well, you know, some of it's good, some of it's bad, let me explain why. That doesn't fit into a soundbite. Uh, so, so we tend to lose out because of that point scoring type of politics. So, so we actually have a sort of party interest in trying to have a debate that isn't just about somebody standing up and saying black and the other person standing up and saying white. Uh, we need a, a more sophisticated debate to get a look in, but also say so very much instinctively that's m my style anyway. I can't stand that. I mean, it's it's uh, intellectually completely incoherent for people to stand up and say everything the government does is bad, and and to want the government to fail, which is the other kind of side of it. We end up in a political situation where you're almost going out as a a representative of the British people to say, oh, the, the British government have failed, they've really screwed up, the economy is lousy, everything's terrible. You know, I don't want to be in a position where I'm sort of wanting the government to fail. That's not very helpful for the country. And our concern has been to provide constructive opposition. This is not the tradition in Britain. The tradition in Britain is that the opposition opposes everything. And indeed, that's what the Conservatives have done over the last four years. Even things that uh, they themselves promoted when they were in government. They've had a, a nasty attack of political amnesia and then, then suddenly decided they're against it. And the extraordinary situation as a result. But we're concerned to look at all the issues on, on their merits and where we think that we can support the government, we've supported them. Where we feel we can't support them, we've opposed them. And that constructive opposition, that pragmatic approach to the issues of the day is rather new for British politics. We would like a, a stronger multi-party system and we advocate a different system of election, the proportional representation system, which would create a more multi-party system. And we now, have, we now have that in Scotland and Wales uh, and indeed in Northern Ireland. They all use proportional representation uh, and have a much more balanced multi-party system. Um, in the longer term, that's what we'd like for the UK National Parliament. But in the shorter term, we recognise that the only way to get there is to have a bigger voice in this much more polarised 
bipartisan system of first past the post. Um, and we need to gain more power, and that power probably is at the expense of the Conservatives. We'd like to use that power to bring in a proportional system that actually would mean that you could have a stronger multi-party system for the foreseeable future, uh, very similar to, to the way which we now have that entrenched in, in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Do, uh, it, and I have no idea, that's what I'm asking, do, do disaffected Labourites from the left ever drop out and join the Liberal Democratic Party? We do, and we, we, had some, we took quite a strong position as a party over the war with Iraq, and the, the Liberal Democrat position was to oppose that, um, that was something we all felt comfortable with. Uh, we, we, we felt that the strategically going to war under those circumstances was a mistake and the, and the party coalesced around that. A lot of people in the Labour Party in particular were very disillusioned with their government because they came from a similar philosophical position where they didn't feel war was the answer uh, to the particular problem we were confronted with. Um, and every time something like that's happened, or the government now have proposals to reform the National Health Service, always very sensitive with Labour supporters, each time that happens, people do drop away from the Labour Party, and quite a number of those do uh, come and join the Liberal Democrats. We try and be quite careful to say that we're not a party, a socialist party in any sense, we're a free market party. But if people share our concerns, and they share our concerns about the international situation, uh, as long as they realise what they're signing up to, then to come and join us, we, we think is quite a sensible uh, future for them. I'd say it's a party of uh, reason, of uh, compassion, uh, but with an emphasis on uh, those people whose voices are silent. And it's generally uh, a party of people who, who want to see, to see uh, a rational, fair, uh, society uh, on the principles that are not far away from the Christian faith. Uh, there are very, very many views of the party, but uh, my uh, membership of the Labour Party came with my mother's milk. It wasn't anything that I had to think about at an early stage, but I did as a young adult uh, become convinced that I was in the White Party. And I was born in the Labour Party and I'll die in the Labour Party, and I'm very proud of its great achievements. In the 1980s and 1990s, the Labour Party was seen as unelectable in Great Britain. Way too far on the left, it was seen as even socialist by many British voters, far too radical in terms of foreign policy issues such as nuclear disarmament. However, in the mid-1990s, Tony Blair brought the Labour Party back to the middle of British politics. The Conservatives even accused Labour of co-opting many of their own policies. In essence, Tony Blair made Labour electable again. So, Labour swept to a resounding victory in 1997 under Tony Blair, and again to a second term victory in 2001, again under Prime Minister Blair. But where now does the Labour Party go to? We talked to members of the Labour Party to see where they see their own party going into the 21st century. I would hope the Labour Party and the Labour government always talk about an inclusive society uh, and giving people a real opportunity to, to get on at their own speed, and giving them the opportunity through education, through health and the rest of it. And not necessarily about whether I can afford it or not. Have I got enough money uh, to, to do what I want to do? I think we've still a long way to go to make it a, a fairer society, but I think they're on the right track. Some would argue that the kind of politics that's now being pursued by New Labour hardly differs at all from the Conservatives. Blair has used phrases such as um, business, uh, government on your side, not in your way, and emphasises very much that the role of government, the role of the state, should be uh, conducted alongside uh, business interests. Also, many of the policies which were introduced by the Conservatives in the 1980s and 1990s have not been reversed. And this includes uh, the widespread privatisation of public utilities, uh, including gas, electricity, rail, uh, telecommunications. All those still remain in the private sector after being sold off by the Thatcher and major governments. Many of the social policies which were introduced by the Conservatives also have not been changed, although in recent years the government have promised to increase expenditure on things like health and education. But many of the philosophies of enterprise culture uh, are still very evident. And 
one of the difficulties that the Labour Party now has is that there is really very little effective opposition from the Conservatives who have suffered uh, two heavy defeats in 1997 and 2001. And certainly traditional uh, members of the Labour Party, those who have associated uh, the party with a, a broader socialist agenda, uh, find it very disappointing to see some of the uh, policy initiatives that are now uh, being developed by Blair. But certainly he argues that what the Labour Party have done is to uh, essentially rethink its direction to come into a much more 21st century environment and that the kind of intellectual baggage which they brought with them from the, really their foundation at the start of this century and their expansion after the First World War is just is essentially not relevant to today's debates and therefore uh, the Blair governments have been much happier to make accommodations with the private sector for the delivery of public services and you can see this for example in the health service, in education where great, much greater emphasis is now placed upon the rights of consumers of these services although principally they have remained under state control. Other areas most certainly haven't and also um, there's been a great deal of debate over the role of the private sector in delivering at least part of public services. The, the, the change of the Labour Party is that we, we've become unelectable. We drifted to the far left and our image was a deplorable one when we had a leader of the party that looked like a scarecrow and he was talking always in terms of what uh, happened in the past and he was, I mean, what he was saying was, was quite sound in many ways, but he was appealing to a tiny audience. The party started to talk to itself and not to the outside world, and we were doomed to, uh, to, to fall from uh, influence of power in this terrible cycle of decline. And uh, thank goodness that Tony Blair and New Labour came along, and they gave a new sheen to the party, a new image to the party that was widely uh, popular, uh, especially among Conservatives and it managed to uh, demoralise uh, our opponents and uh, greatly encourage uh, Labour Party members. As a result of all, we've had two of the biggest victories that have ever occurred in British history in uh, two successive elections. So there is that feeling of uh, loyalty and gratitude for that. But the problem is that we've probably lost our soul in the process that we moved from a party that was reforming, that was radical, into a party that seemed to be doing compromises with every interest group that was available to ensure we, we had this slow drip of, uh, of popularity and praise, of adulation from the daily press. And that's fine, that will probably keep you in power, but it's no way to change the world for the better. And there's been, uh, I'm afraid, uh, there, there has been what we could call stealth socialism. The, the Labour Party has done a great deal to move wealth uh, from the richest to the poorest. They've been very successful in doing that. But we're almost ashamed to tell people about it, that it's stealth socialism. In case, uh, if we tell people about it, the tabloid newspapers uh, might hear about it and might get angry and condemn us. But things have happened. I mean, I've been pleased with the record of the last uh, uh, government and the present government. But I believe that uh, we, we don't have that vigour and that certainty and that self-confidence that we did in what, to my mind, is the best uh, government we had in Britain, which was the 45-51 Labour government that set up the health service and managed to reorganise the public services in, in a way that was fair and efficient. And we're very, we're a very long way away from those heady, radical, reforming, self-confident days. After 18 years of not being in power, and then the, the victory in 97, it seems to be the people now have a, there's a great support for the Labour Party. What, what's sort of the difference between, we could say, old Labour and now the, the new Labour? I think that's a false uh, argument, uh, that what's happened is that the Labour Party in government uh, has decided that it won't be a party representing simply uh, the underclass, the exclusively the poor, it will be a party that represents the people who are aspiring to a better life, the people who are ambitious for themselves. It will be a party that represents a social institution of the family uh, rather than the class institution of the trade union. That's to say, it's both a pro-trade union family and a pro-party. It's become much more a party that gathers in people rather than a party that believes it has an ideology which, if it wins support at the ballot box, it then will put on the 
they impose on the country. It's also a party that uh, I think learns in power. It's very much struck me as the way policies have been changed, uh, approaches have been changed. It's a very flexible approach to government rather than a strongly ideological one. I think that may be one of the reasons for its success. There's something in uh, the Labour Party or Labour government for nearly everybody in the country. It's quite difficult today to um, discuss the Labour Party. Certainly um, there have been some considerable changes in its structure, in its ideology and also in its leadership. The Labour Party up until really the early 1990s had gone through a very, very difficult period in trying to respond to the electoral successes of the Conservative Party. Margaret Thatcher as Prime Minister won the election, of, well, became Prime Minister, and then in 1979 won the elections in 1983 and 1987. And much to the great disappointment of the Labour Party, the Conservatives, now led by John Major, also won in 1992. What happened, although a little before that, but certainly after 1992, was a great rethinking of the ideological direction. Tony Blair eventually came to lead the party after the death of the then leader, John Smith, in 1994. And we started to see a very different image. We started to see a party that wished to emphasize that it wasn't essentially socialist. Uh, it was very much more social democratic. Uh, they even changed the name and started to emphasise very much that they were called New Labour. They dropped various symbols that the party had always been associated with. For example, the red flag now became a red rose. And it was interesting that the red rose also had no thorns on it. Um, so again, a big image change. I, I've got to admit, I'm um, what they call old Labour. Um, I'm, I'm to the left of Tony Blair, but it's no seven in an old Labour Party that's not electable. And if you, this is probably the most electable Labour Party that you'll ever have. It is one that can stay in power, and it's going to stay in power for two full terms at least, as far as we can see. Uh, that's something that's never happened before to Labour. Um, I'm very pleased with uh, a lot of the things they've done. I think the big mistake, as far as I'm concerned, is that they agreed to uh, stick to the Tory uh, policies on expenditure and taxation and I think more money was needed. I don't think they really knew the scope of what was needed in the schools, in the hospitals and it was necessary to put up tax and of course because of the election promises they couldn't do that and they're still promising not to put up tax. Uh, but I think, I think that was probably a mistake. Having said that they've done an awful a lot of good and things are improving. I think, to be honest, even Labour supporters would admit the change hasn't been as great as they hoped for or expected. Just to take an example, a major example, um, it was thought that the new government, the new Labour government, would want to invest a great deal more of the public's funds into our health service, which is very important in Britain, into our education service, schools and universities, into paying better rates of basic pension and to, into the police. Now, on all scores, the new government actually decided to keep the same spending pattern as its Conservative predecessors. And the result has been that there's been no great change in, in, in those particular services in the first three years of the new government. So much so that even Labour MPs were talking about not just 18 years of Conservative rule, but 20 or 21 years, hmm. because the Conservative rule continued after the Conservatives left office. What it seems to me has happened is that while wrapping it up in language that comforts the phrase Middle England, i.e. those voters who don't usually vote Labour but were seduced into voting Labour, they wrap them up in words that uh, give them comfort. The effect of what they're doing, in, in essence, is to become more and more socialist. We are now becoming a, a tax-raising and spending economy. We are tying businesses up in red tape. We're making it more difficult to hire and fire workers. We are making, moving towards the European model, which is the sclerotic social model of Germany. I think uh, there's been a fair amount of criticism uh, of the Prime Minister in, in 97 and still from areas like this that uh, he has targeted Middle England and by Middle England we, we talk about the, the reason we're well to do it.
But in fairness, you can have the most radical Labour government ever, or ra radical party, I should say, but you'll not get in power. Uh, you, you have to target the people across the spectrum, uh, and that's why they got, got the title New Labour to some extent. It's, uh, it's a social democratic party to some degree. These are my personal views. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a social democratic party, but the public service, giving people an opportunity, especially the youngsters, is critically important in today's, uh, in today's society. But I, I don't see it's any new than what it always was. <laughs> Just a word. The direction of the um, Labour Party uh, is uh, in a very different direction to that which was in the 1980s and uh, 1990s. In the 1980s, the Labour Party had a very definite left-wing agenda. In fact, the party manifesto, the party platform, if you like, in 1983, was described by one Labour politician as the longest suicide note in history uh, and made Labour virtually unelectable. And that's when we see, by the late 80s, the modernisation process begin. But also, some would say of the Blair governments that they have abandoned the traditional principles of the Labour Party. Um, others feel that's um, a harsh uh, reaction and certainly Tony Blair likes to emphasise concepts such as a stakeholder society. The government emphasises very much their campaign against social exclusion. The government also uh, claims that they should take a communi communitarian approach whereby um, everyone in society should benefit from the policies pursued by government. Uh, unfortunately to many critics of the Labour government that sounds very much like the language of the Conservative Party in the 80s and the 90s. I think there were two factors in 1997 that produced that big Labour landslide. The first that people were absolutely sick and tired of the Tories, uh, including many Tory voters who um, actually stayed at home and didn't vote. And the second thing was that um, the determination bred of the last five years under the Tories of the Labour Party to try and get back into government, to try and alter the sort of approach that the government was taking with the Conservatives in power, meant that there was a uh, discipline and determination that we didn't have, uh, I think, in previous elections. And there was also um, a readiness to rethink certain policies that had stood for a long time. And what that produced, I think, was the second major factor, which was that people felt for the first time for a long time that um, Labour was a, a party that, uh, to some extent, they felt they could trust and were prepared to give it a go. And that's why, in very large numbers, we had people who previously voted Tory or Liberal Democrat back in Labour, uh, which helped produce the landslide in 1997. Build, build on the progress we've made. Give everyone the chance to make the most of themselves, deliver better lives for those hard-working families. United in our values, proud in our record, optimistic about the future, with the courage of our convictions, we can deliver the third term and therefore deliver the lasting change. I tell you, conference, it is worth the fight. Now let's get out and do it. It is impossible, of course, to talk about the modern Labour Party without discussing the man who brought it back from the dead, Tony Blair. Blair is disliked by many and admired by many, but his political skills and leadership qualities are respected by friends and enemies. At first he was called Bill Clinton without the scandals for his campaigning prowess and ability to co-opt ideas from other parties. But he has now surpassed Clinton, not only by his staying power in office, but by his transformation of the Labour Party. Blair called his policies the third way, emphasizing the modern, efficient, global, and less socialistic state that he argued Britain must become. I mean, here, here was a man with a, a family background, 
an experience and a set of values which put him very strongly in the centre ground of British politics, centre left but centre ground. And so he personified, if you like, the Labour Party's fresh appeal to what sometimes is called Middle England, but is um, you know very much about um, voters and people in London, the South East, um, uh, perhaps um, people who reasonably well off that hadn't regarded the Labour Party as a natural home for them in, in the recent years. And so, and, and, and plus, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a strong leader, he's charismatic, and uh, so he carried very much, um, uh, with the support of the party, he carried a lot of that uh, sense of um, uh, fresh appeal. His, his legacy, um, even I, I, I would have thought, would be recognised by those who have disapproved of his uh, policies, even from within the Labour Party, in that certainly Labour were transformed. I mean, Labour uh, were in a very difficult position in the late 1980s. There was a modernisation of the party, and I think Blair's real contribution, some obviously would feel it's a negative contribution, but nonetheless his real contribution was to set about to, as he saw it, to modernise the party. I mean, that was the term which began to be used by the mid-1990s. Uh, mid also, he brought about one or two changes, uh, which also have been very significant. Um, the relationships with the trade unions in Britain has changed quite dramatically. Um, the, La uh, the Labour Party was very much the invention, the creation, if you like, um, of the trade unions at the start of the 19th century. Um, Blair, following on from the previous leader, uh, John Smith, has changed that relationship. The trade unions now play a much less important role, even though they still make a substantial financial contribution. And certainly some of the trade unions uh, have, have become very irritated with New Labour and have uh, threatened to withdraw their financial help. So he certainly has, has distanced the Labour Party from the trade unions. Also, the organisation of the uh, Labour Party is now considerably uh, slicker, more efficient, some would say far too concerned with image. But um, he has brought the Labour Party from what should have, what was, you know, the uh, a very, very weak electoral position to uh, produce two election results which were quite remarkable. It's the first time really in the history of the Labour Party that they've been able to uh, put themselves in, apart really from 1945, to put themselves into a position where they can control and direct the economy and you know, uh, re reorganise social welfare and whatever, but some would say at a, uh, at a cost. Um, whether or, or not he goes down as a great Prime Minister, I still, still think might be uh, damaged by the, the decision to go to war because um, evidently there's quite a lot of dissension within the Labour Party and a feeling that, well perhaps not that they were deceived, but certainly the, the information upon which the decision was based for many Labour MPs was quite frankly now seen to be flawed. How much damage that will do to him in the long term, I'm, I'm not really certain. But certainly in terms of his legacy to the Labour Party, I think he'll, he'll be seen as uh, the person who, like it or not, turned the Labour Party around quite significantly and also put it into a position, an electoral position, that quite frankly it's uh, never had before. Others would say, but yet, uh, at what ideological cost? And um, certainly uh, critics of the Blair administration and the Blair style have described uh, the new Labour Party's policies as basically recycled Thatcherism. And certainly his critics would say that he, you know, Tony Blair was actually created by Margaret Thatcher's policies in the 1980s and um, John Majors in the, in the 1990s. I think that's probably a harsh criticism, but one that's understandable, particularly from those uh, traditional Labour socialists. The main issue at the moment is uh, the, the global issues of seeing a world uh, that's uh, run uh, on a, a reasonable, fair basis, and not one that's dominated by any power, even the United States. And the, we, we'd 
like to see uh, ask you, uh, the we like to see Africa rescued from the misery that it's in at the moment. And I think uh, our feelings for the rest of the century is that it should be based on uh, democratic principles when those work in the third world countries, and that we avoid a domination. Uh, by uh, commercial interests, uh, by the greed of uh, those who seek to make profits uh, out of other people, and that we have a globalized world uh, that's based on the, say, the founding principles of the League of Nations, the United Nations at the moment. I think we've traveled some way away from that uh, at the moment. I think we've got to maintain this dual approach. On the one hand, economic dynamism, job creation, flexibility, embracing the new economy, changing, getting people into work, cutting the barriers to job creation. Because if everybody is in work, you have a tax base, and you also have a social power of people in work that allows you to do, from a progressive reformist point of view, progressive reformist uh, types of things. And then to maintain the idea that we're all citizens in one society, this is one nation, the United Kingdom, everybody is a citizen of it, everybody has certain rights, uh, everybody should have a share of our rising prosperity. And the best way of delivering that in the modern world is through very good public services. And I hope to see an investment in public services, much tougher management of the police, of the health services, of our schools, uh, because we take a huge amount of money off people in taxation. But it's a bit like a water company when we spend it uh, uh, about 30% leaks and not all of that uh, money or that arrives in the faucets where the people really need it. What would you say are the challenges for the Labour Party in the, in, up until the next election? To uh, make ourselves uh, electorally popular so that we can stay in power and not to do too many compromises with what our traditional principles are, which is to have a world that's fair, rational, compassionate. And the difficulty is, is to compete against uh, popular opinion, uh, which appeals to the lowest common denominator of uh, public opinion, their homophobia, uh, their racism, uh, their anti-foreigner attitude, and to make sure that we stick with what have been the Labour Party values of socialism and fair play, uh, that have uh, maintained us uh, as a movement and a party uh, for the last hundred years. We've tried to give you some insight into the basic functionings of the British political system, with the added benefit of hearing from members of Parliament themselves about what MPs do and how Parliament works. I hope that this approach not only helps you understand democracy in the United Kingdom, but also parliamentary systems in general as they make up the majority of democratic systems in the world.